Grim Coven is a one to four player boss battler where you play as hunters of the Grim Coven, a bunch of edgelords who signed a pact in blood to go out there and do boss battling against big bad grief bounds. The whole world is covered in lament, which is some amorphous red substance that spawns from suffering and can transform dudes into monsters. So while the grief bound bosses are in fact people who gave in to horribly bad vibes, the same can happen to you, the hunters as well. Let's go over how to play. The game Gameplay is divided into the Hunter's Phase and the Enemy Phase. Hunter's Phase is fundamentally you doing a bunch of upkeep before taking your actual turns, while Enemy Phase is just these five steps where you go and activate all the bad guys. You will keep repeating these phases back and forth until you either win by killing the boss, or you lose when any one of you dies. The two most important facets to understand about Hunters is their corruption level and the action system. By simply playing the game, you're going to end up getting lament from various sources, like from killing stuff, or even just picking it up off the ground. Lament will go on your board, where you can then move it onto your corruption track during all the Hunter's Phase upkeep in order to grow stronger whenever you hit one of these unlock points. The 10 corruption flip means you flip your Hunter tile and swap out your mini with your corrupted version that has better passive abilities and more health, while those unlock symbols let you either gain more action dice of your choice, or more cards that give additional actions and passives. What the hell are action dice? Well, that's the other important facet, which is that your actions are taken like this. During all that hunter's phase upkeep, you roll all of your hunter's action dice, at which point they all become available to spend on your actions. Your actions all have these square slots you can put the action dice on, with blanks accepting any dice, while icons need to die with specifically that icon. Different dice colors are more likely to roll different icons. So after you do all your upkeep, when it comes to actually taking turns, you're only allowed to take two actions before letting the next player take their two actions. You keep doing this until everyone declares that they're done doing actions for this phase, which people usually do once they're out of available action dice. As for what those actions look like, everyone shares the same five basic actions on the left side of their board, while the rest of the actions will come from cards that are unique to your hunter that you start out with and gain more of as you get more corrupted. Your turns will usually consist of players staring at their dice for a while, figuring out what's possible to do and how much damage they can output in total before they move around and start hurting enemies while also positioning themselves so as to not take too much incoming damage because you can always see what the enemies are going to do on their turns. Speaking of, the enemy phase goes like Step 1, Event Deck. Random bad stuff happens here if there's a phase up event card active. Step 2, all minions activate, which is usually just these little shitters who run up and bonk you for slight damage, but it can add up if you aren't careful. By the way, every enemy in this game will attack by rolling X amount of these 12-sided dice, and the icons rolled will do variable amounts of damage listed on their stats. Step 3, the Elite activates, who's a goon who's in between minions and boss and power level who will also run up and hit you almost as hard as the boss itself. Step 4, the boss does its action card for this turn. Follow its steps top down before discarding the action card, moving the face up next turn card down to this turn and drawing a new next turn card. Step 5 is the boss has a time track that progresses, which incrementally makes the fight harder by doing all sorts of things like adding more minions, flipping over a new face up event card, getting new passive buffs on the boss stage cards, etc. Lastly, just so you understand how to hurt the boss, you can attack any of its face-up attack cards, and doing enough damage removes it from the game. Remove enough cards, and you eventually get to a point where you force out the boss's final action card, since it can't reshuffle its discard since you removed too many cards. At which point, instead of doing next turn, this turn, it's permanently only just final action on this turn. Every turn. Deal enough damage there, and you win. Cool, we're on the same page on Grim Coven's gameplay, minus all the nuances, like all the variable map setup shenanigans, and line of sight and stats effects and enemy movement pathing tie breaks and yada yada all the classic rulings of board games with minis running around on a grid of hexes. But before we move on to analysis, first, disclaimer stuff. I played four times, two of them two-headed and the other two on the solo mode. Plus, watched a fifth game with Pranav and Alex, who's a guy that really, 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 really likes Kingdom Death Monster. And please be aware that this is a paid sponsored video, so there's potentially biases influencing my opinions. I try not to let that affect me as I personally think I'm being honest with my thoughts, but I can't be my own media watchdog, so I'll let you guys be the judge of that. Hopefully all this analysis can speak for itself, so let's get on with it to Component Bros! Now obviously this is all prototype components, and there's stuff that's not going to be in the final version of the game. In fact, we got emailed this PDF that has their plan for what will be final, but there's still things that have been really nice to play with that I want to point out. First off, there's an absurd amount of dice included, which is so nice for a dice allocation based action system that continues 
grows throughout a session. Prototype has 42 D6s, final version plans have 60 plus, and you're most definitely not going to need that much most of the time. But if anyone, or God forbids, multiple players ever want to run around all using similar dice colors, looks like your dream meme builds are likely going to be possible. Also, these deluxe version double layered boards with slots for everything are so fucking nice. Not only do they look really cool because they actually have a unique shape instead of just being a rectangle, but they also bring amazing quality of life tactile feel. Like anytime a game has you take on a bajillion tokens and cubes and dice, it's painful if it's all just on a flat surface player board when dealing with big numbers slash long tracks. Especially if there's a ton of dice rolling and you accidentally push a marker that's on a long track and you forgot where it was. That or it's intended to go on your character's art, which kind of sucks because why is Dart even there if it's just going to be blocked during gameplay? Meanwhile, Grim Coven will regularly get into game states where there's a ton of tokens here to track wounds and debuffs, you're obviously slotting dice constantly, and there's a big stupid long track via corruption. Yet it's all super smooth to play with, and pretty much everything you'll receive in the game has its own slot and it's all labeled. Makes me big sad that these recessed boards are only for the deluxe version because honestly I feel they add a significant amount to the experience and should be included with the standard version. Especially if these boards get further improved upon in the final release because this isn't even the actual look. Apparently there's going to be an acrylic marker for corruption instead of cubes, but I can think of even further improvements because I'm personally a huge fan of when components are hyper intuitive and functional, as in they're kind of self-evident and explain the game while also being its organizer. So like as an example, say the player boards were made just a bit bigger and had this flow of resolution through it. Like if at the top left there's like an empty half circle where the first player token goes and there's a slot for tokens that specifically trigger at the start of the hunters phase like hunger and then further right there's the corruption track. This way anyone can look at this and see that if red left to right it all lines up with all the upkeep on the player aid. Very idiot proof. No way you'll forget to resolve passing the first player token or hunger or corruption etc. If they somehow manage to make the epitome of an excellent player board that had different slots for every different status token while maintaining an intuitive reading flow so that you'd resolve everything in its proper step I'd actually be corrupted with whatever the opposite of lament is. This is my thing now. My complaint motif. Put double layered recessed boards in every board game. Make that shit as good as Scythe where it's a player aid and an organizer. The best player aid is no player aid and the game just explains it all purely through presentation. Speaking of, hey, look at the boss board. Look at these vertical enemy step standees. You pretty much don't even need the player aid. Like, look, when it's the enemy phase, the current face up event activates. Then minions go. Then elite goes. Then the boss goes. Then the time track progresses. Then you're back to hunter's phase. Fuck. That's clean. In general, I'd love to see more designers play around with verticality in board games in ways that aren't just minis, because I feel like that's mostly unexplored territory and is honestly way more readable than laying everything flat on the table. Possibly saving more table space in the process. Like, when are we going to get board games that have double layered recessed boards, which can stand up and you can slot cars into them? I need to dial it back. I'm not even listing pros at this point. I'm actually just yapping. Look, Point is, these prototype boards are sick. Like, having double layered boards with tons of slots is already going above and beyond. Guess that's what you get with giant board game companies like Awaken Realms. But I'm just saying, they could be even better, which is absolutely crazy to think about, so please don't fuck up the final version with the acrylic corruption marker Awaken Realms, cause this shit is gas. Back to pros, even though I just dunked on the concept of player aids, these player aids are very good. They big, they got brief descriptions of pretty much every game facet that has to do with turn by turn structure, and even though they're double sided, the division of information is done in a way so that you don't need to constantly flip them. Like, oh, I'm gonna do all the hunter's phase upkeep, then once it actually gets to our turns, I flip this, boom, basic action is gonna leave it like that until we're done doing all our actions and flip back to resolve enemies. But yeah, these were really smooth to give out to newcomers. They read it, get the gist, and then once they know what's up, because everything has really good bolding and color coding, people only have to read the big red and big yellow words for resolution order, which are hella easy to skim and distinct from the explanation text. And then, the iconography in this game is great too, where everything is both simple and distinct enough from each other that they're even recognizable at small sizes. Like, there is no fucking way you're mixing up the enemy attack die symbols, nor are you mixing up the player's sword, shield, gear arrow thing, and magic star, or the reroll token that's 
literally a cube with arrows around it. Nothing ever came up with icons while playing, and the only hypothetical I can think of would be like, maybe the gear with arrow icon and the Technomancer's unique dice that have just a gear, but like, that's Technomancer specific anyways, and I'm sure the player playing that hunter would clearly see the difference. I don't know, I'm really reaching here. Also, the status tokens are colored with very distinct looks from each other, and they do my favorite thing ever, where one side has no text while the other does. Because in that way, the newcomers can look and see their names, and seasoned players can stick with just the icons so as to not add more visual noise to their board with extra text. Or you can just have a preference for either way, you can do whatever side you like. And as always, the mini sculpts are absolutely crazy, which is to be expected from Awakened Realms, but damn, it hits different every time. Unfortunately, as they are prototypes, I can't speak on their durability, because they feel brittle and there's bits of snapped mini everywhere in this foam tray box they sent, but again, they have a good precedent on this end. The final minis are probably going to be up to par with their standard quality, and obviously proper packaging with proper inserts for all the minis goes a long way. Oh yeah, we also got colored mini bases. Another thing that I think should be standard across all board games if you're playing as humanoids with similar silhouettes for their minis. It's not even really needed here, considering that your hunters look pretty wildly different from each other, especially after transforming, but great to see anyways for immediate clarity. Especially because everyone's player board colors matters because of something called an assist marker that I'll get into later in gameplay. Minions also have a little slot where you can put in defense tokens, very nice to see, so that you don't have some separate board somewhere with a bunch of numbers and you gotta assign tokens individually to different minions. This also kind of ties into gameplay because minions always only have one health, which really makes them feel like minions and cuts out all the bookkeeping. Yet the way the game increases their health if need be without making it annoying is giving them defense that go right on the mini for easy readability. Gameplay pros! Let's start with the fundamentals. Not only is this game really easy to teach, but it also has a ton of very mishmash mechanics pulled in from a lot of familiar places while somehow remaining intuitive. Like because actions are dice allocation, it's very easy to grasp the whole, oh, I roll all this, then put the icons on available slots to do things, and then boom, you're already planning out your turn. You got all incoming attacks being telegraphed because you can always see exactly what all the enemies are doing as they always resolve their cards top down with minions and elites only doing one thing from their list, which is whatever is applicable first, while bosses do everything on the card. Also, secret component pro in gameplay, boom, the minion and elite cards always remind you of this. And then as you grow stronger and level up, you'll notice that yes, you're getting big strong, but also you start taking more random bad shit because during hunter phase upkeep, there's a corruption step where everyone draws one corruption card. And it becomes obvious from looking at any one of these cards that you'll be getting fucked over more for getting too powerful. It's like this hodgepodge of spirit island where you perfectly see the next two upcoming big bad things, so there's really no reason not to plan ahead for the next round, and you're occasionally doing whack-a-mole with minions popping up every now and then. There's sort of the dice actions from ISS Vanguard. I haven't played that game, but I'm told there's similarities with the whole two actions, assigned dice thing going on. Then there's the corruption track being like Cthulhu Death May Die's Insanity, where you get stronger from it, but it's also a means of hurting you. Combine all this together, and what do you get? Turns out, super solid gameplay foundation, because when you always know what the enemies will do, but not exactly how much damage, combined with knowing exactly what you want to do, but not always being able to do it, that tug of war leads to players having to make interesting decisions as they figure out what concessions to make as they navigate these systems to map out what sequencing of actions and map positioning need to be done to pull out the W. A look at the dice, look at your available actions, figure out what's the most efficient damage output, and then consider if that's worth doing and getting hit for big damage from really threatening enemies, or see if there's a way to circumvent unnecessary incoming damage retaliation, like running away after attacking, or gaining a defense token from your actions, which is a one-time use thing you can only hold one up to reduce damage by its amount. And even if you're big brain enough to see the full picture and play perfectly, it's still really hard to get there. Especially because you have to do two actions at a time unless you declare that you pass. In which case, you're done for the whole phase and don't use any leftover available action dice. So you probably don't want to be doing that and wasting actions. Essentially, because you have to do two actions at a time, it gets muddier how to sequence everything properly because it would be so much easier if someone could just do their turn all at once and do all their actions. Or if it was freeform with players doing any amount of actions they want before letting the next player do the same. Okay, what the fuck am I saying? What did that all mean? Let's do an example. But first, I gotta explain something. Hunters are special. They usually have mechanics unique to themselves that require doing some amount of prep in a precise order to get maximum efficiency going. The gunslinger literally spends actions loading bullets that can be 
spent on attacks. The Technomancer has extra orange dice exclusive to them with its own unique icon for their own unique actions. And Duality has light and darkness tokens generated from using specific colored dice that can then be spent for additional actions or as costs for juiced up actions. So let's take an example here where you got a Gunslinger and a Technomancer figuring out the most efficient way to attack the boss's card. And what they really want is for the Gunslinger to be the one to finish off that boss card because they stacked effects that proc off of fucking up boss cards. Unfortunately, the Gunslinger right now is being silly because they don't have enough bullets loaded to not only add enough extra damage to make this kill shot possible, but they also want to proc this other ability that gets huge returns for spending at least three bullets in one go. So now they got to spend a turn or so reloading. Meanwhile, the Technomancer is already good to go. They're in position to attack. They already used all their other non-attack actions, so they can't really take a turn or so to stall by moving or prepping. The Technomancer's most efficient play to avoid passing for good this Hunter's phase is to just attack. But whoops, their remaining options are attacks that are pretty strong at two damage, with one of them even being an attack that can move the boss. If the Technomancer unleashes these attacks right now, they'll be the one to remove the boss attack card, which uncovers the boss response card. By the way, every boss has one of these to default to if you delete their usual attack card. And would you look at that? Moving the boss three spaces away would nullify this response and keep the hunters safe from the boss. That's really good, of course, but what's also really good is letting the gunslinger pop the fuck off with their bingus bungus omega nutty combo shot, which this Technomancer play would deny. So now there's this dilemma going on where the Technomancer doesn't want to waste their turn, but they have to do something unless they pass and throw away all this damage. Like, they could attack the other card for next turn, because you can target either card so as to not waste this damage, but then there's no point in moving the boss because, one, that play was contingent on breaking this turn's boss attack card and revealing the response card, and two, the Gunslinger needs the boss to be in its current position and they can't move because they spent their sprint icon die not on sprint, but instead on loading a bullet that's needed for the extra damage. That was a lot of jargon, but in essence, the decision is as follows. Do not waste any damage, let the Gunslinger pop off and get their huge refresh combo, but this results in the Technomancer getting hit from the boss response. Or you play it safe, and only the Technomancer really deals damage, but the Hunters will take no damage from the boss while the Gunslinger is denied their big wombo. Of note, by the way, while situations like these are very much possible all the time, if you're playing smart with how you're sequencing everyone's increments of two actions, they're definitely avoidable. Like, that hilariously unideal situation could have been completely avoided had the two Hunters better coordinated their actions from the start of this phase. Is that not just quarterbacking heaven? Well, I guess so if you're big brain enough, but there's enough complication going on here that it's really hard to keep track of the specific nuances of sequencing needed from other players. And it's much more likely you'll be familiar with other players' efficacy, like how much damage they can do, but not so much the steps needed to get there. Usually these mechanisms will result in table talk that's something like, hey, I need three turns before I move there and do four damage all at once. Oh shit, hey, can I get an assist marker from you right now? Oh wait, you can only do that next turn. Shit. What's an assist marker? Well, this is one of the cooler actions of the game on a fundamental level. You can put any die there as an action, and then you give your player color assist marker to someone else in their available dice pool. That marker is now a stand-in for the die you slotted into your assist action. And it's a really cool way of RNG mitigation in that it encourages you to give a shit about other people because it's really efficient and guaranteed to fix someone else's bad luck while fixing yours is a crapshoot. Unless you ask for an assist from someone else. Because yeah, otherwise you can obtain a resource called a tactics token that can be spent to reroll as many of your available dice as you like. Which is great, but honestly, if you're building your hunter well, it doesn't really feel like you need to be using this often, nor do you need to use it on a bunch of dice all at once, but hey, more ways to mitigate RNG never hurts. Basically, Grim Coven, despite having a dice allocation system, isn't actually wacky, whoa, what the randomness, since everything here is input randomness with a lot of reaction time and ways to fix your dice. Combine that with how the game state is perpetually just a bunch of shit happening all over a place that you gotta keep track of, the skill here not only comes from reacting to and assessing everything that's going on and what's to come, but also an efficiency puzzle with your actions that is already pretty engaging by itself, and then made even crazier when considering assists and rerolls to weave into your
your turns if action timing is prudent. And what makes it even more pressing to care a lot about managing all this well is how good healing is pretty rare in Grim Coven. Like straight up, one of the primary and best sources of healing is from transforming. Because otherwise, most of the time, healing exists in small doses like one or two. Like, I don't think I've seen heal fours except from transforming or from picking up one time only treasure chests. But usually when grabbing those chests, you want to get them early and pick power ramping like an extra die or more corruption rather than wait till you're hurt to grab them to heal. If you're not paying attention to enemy behavior, where you're standing and managing defense tokens, it's pretty easy to just get jumped by a ton of enemies and take like half your health in the first turn while also being afflicted with a ton of status tokens. Especially because this is a game where figures can share a space and do attacks in range zero. So enemies can always group up on you and maul you. Plus, defense tokens being limited as one-time use makes their value a lot more misleading than straight up looking at them as pseudo healing for their given values. Like sometimes you gotta use a defense four on a small attack that absolutely should not land. And a lot of the time, I'm not gonna be greedy and will just use defense four on three damage if there's no other big attacks incoming. Another really interesting defensive aspect is how boss attacks may have focus text on them, which are additional effects that you can stop the boss from doing simply by doing damage to the card that matches or exceeds player count. In practice, letting a boss resolve all their focused effects, remember bosses do everything on the card top down, basically guarantees that someone's getting hit because all of this is really hard to escape. And in the worst situations, if you straight up get hit with everything, you are probably losing most of your health because remember, at base, you have around 12 to 14 health. Like, imagine the boss hits all the hunters with all of this. That's so many dice rolls. Holy shit. And trust me, most of the boss attacks are like this. You have to be super cognizant of them because getting hit by any boss for full effect usually absolutely chunks your health. Getting hit by the boss in general hurts a lot though, so really you should be doing everything in your power to distance yourself from them or block incoming damage. But also, sometimes it's really annoying to go out of your way to hurt the boss just to stop a focus effect when it could be directed towards something else that's pressing like minions or the elite. Especially because this chip damage to the boss is likely just throwaway damage that's going to be healed off. Remember when I explained how you can attack any of the boss's face-up attack cards? Well, you're probably attacking the current one and after the boss resolves their turn, everything slides down. So this turn's card goes to discard pile, next turn goes to this turn, you get a new next turn card, yada yada, but then that discarded card? All tokens on it fall off. If you're actually going for it and deciding to hurt the boss, you gotta focus fire so that damage doesn't get wasted. Excellent damage tax mechanic in that it's an interesting decision to mull over in your moment-to-moment -moment gameplay when counting up and deciding where you direct your damage. Next up, the difference between cleanse step and a cleanse action is really thoughtful mechanically. While I do think the names should be changed to avoid confusion, the difference is that during all the upkeep, there's a point where you're allowed to expend dice with the magic star symbol on them to get rid of one status token each. The primary reason this is important is because it happens before you actually start taking turns, which matters a lot, particularly for stun and burn. Stun, you put the token on actions to cover them up, meaning they're straight up blocked until you cleanse it. And burn means you take one damage per burn at the start of the hunter's turn step. Not every time it's your turn, just the once, right when everyone starts taking their turns. Because otherwise, if you took burn damage every time it went back to your turn to do two actions, you'd be absolutely cooked if you had multiple burn tokens. Back to the point though, because there's a cleanse step, you have a window to react to burn and stun tokens before they actually start to matter. But it's important to note that this is inefficient because the cleanse action for one die lets you get rid of two status tokens. Granted, this stops being a decision if you have a ton of available magic star symbol dice available, because there's only one cleanse action slot, but realistically, if you were choosing to level up by getting purple dice with tons of magic star symbols, you probably had a build going on that uses them. So you're probably still going to have to think about how and when you're going to be spending those dice. Can you afford to skip cleanse step and take the burn damage so you can be more efficient with the cleanse action? Do you really need to be doing those magic star actions? Going to have to weigh all that and count ahead a few turns to see how much burn damage you'll take in total. And when it comes to stuns, because they have to be allocated to unoccupied slots when you get stun tokens, it's entirely possible they're forced to end up blocking the cleanse action. And it would be really stupid if you could just never cleanse ever again, so the cleanse step is a great countermeasure that not only adds thoughtful decisions, but avoids the necessity of a rule somewhere saying, stun can never be placed on cleanse action. Also, side note, stun is done really well in this game because it's not a turn ender. Rather, it just makes your turns suck more and can be cleared off fairly easily. Like, you're never gonna be in a situation where your turn is skipped unless you took on not only a ludicrous amount of stun,
done, but also outside of the enemies phase, because let's be real here, if the enemies are going, that means it was after all the players who haven't refreshed their dice yet. So there's definitely a bunch of occupied slots that stun can't go on. You know what? Fuck it. All the stats effects are actually really interesting. Like hunger is not only super thematic, but it's also a debuff that could potentially help you if played well. At the start of hunter's phase, again, this isn't the hunter's turns. This is that entire block. Hunger makes you move towards the closest ally and deal damage to them if you move onto them, with both movement and damage equaling the amount of hunger tokens you got. This can easily fuck you over, not just by taking a bite out of your teammate, but also by moving you out of position. But it can also be a free move if you have big brain to last round by positioning everyone in such a way that hunters are on other sides of the map and you accounted for the boss AI moving it between you guys. And oh look, what do you know? You just hungered perfectly onto the boss's space trying to move onto your teammate and saved yourself having to spend dice on movement. Though realistically, it's not actually efficient. It probably just meant you had to purposely use an action to run away last turn to set this up. But if you were going to run away anyways to deal with something else, then yeah, efficiency. Weak and vulnerable don't impact decision making nearly as hard. But they're both really weird ways of harming players that make really good use of Grim Coven's mechanics. Weak makes you reroll any dice with double icons during refresh step before discarding itself. And vulnerable makes it so that if an enemy ever rolls a resolve that doesn't do anything because their attack doesn't list it, vulnerable will instead make it do one damage per token. These cause more preemptive decisions, like if you have a build that uses a lot of double icons and you have a lot of that dice, so you're pretty likely to see doubles for the icon type you want, you may end up reconsidering tanking a hit that can inflict weak if you're looking to pull off the sickest of wobble combo turns that needs those doubles. Similarly, if you have a bunch of vulnerable tokens, you're looking to avoid getting hit by any attack that's missing one of the three enemy attack icons. Though most notably, minions become a lot more threatening because you can normally sort of tank like one or two of them, but vulnerable makes that proposition much more risky. Last thing in the pros are the map environment cards that are randomly set up for causing goofy hijinks. Varying from barely doing anything to, oh my god, this just made the whole fight significantly easier. Generally speaking, these are going to be helpful modifier cards that slot into a hex and make something happen for you, ending your move in there. However, there's some really memorable high impact outliers here. Busy Minions, for example, is absolutely hysterical if it pops up on an undead general boss fight. Because this environment card causes some minions to pop up here and stay inert the entire time unless you go bother them. Additionally, if a minion walks into this space, they become part of the busy crew too. And the rules say there's a model cap of four models per space. But there's only eight minions max, so as long as you don't go near these guys just minding their own business, the amount of minions on board is cut in half. But wait, when the hell are there ever going to be all eight minions out? Against the undead general, that's a very real possibility because this guy's gimmick is just spawning out a ton of dudes and commanding them. So he gets absolutely wrecked by this card. Otherwise, it acts more like a trap zone where you avoid trying to go near it so as to not set off a bunch of goons all at once. Unless you have AoE, in which case enjoy the free lament. But no, that's not the craziest environment because there's stuff that has specific minis and map tiles. Like there's a carriage that you can check out and it makes you draw from a number of possible secret cards. One of them even being an escort quest where you got to move the thing across the map. I never actually managed to complete that, but I looked at the cards and yeah, pretty huge reward. Then there's this witch house tile that can be placed where you can either steal from her or talk to her for more random secret card effects that, again, tend to be much higher impact than the environment cards that kind of just do small generic good things for going on them and spending certain actions. I mean, they better be. These ones are straight up putting actual stuff onto the board. Always a big fan of when there's more minis on the map to not just bring your table to life, but also when they're actually interactable in some way with your game's mechanics. Component cons! Starting with the minis, the colored base rings can be blocked by protruding features from the minis, which seems like a whack oversight. Funny enough though, these prototype rings work fine because they're rubber and have a gap, which honestly may be preferred over plastic snap-on rings that the campaign page says will be included. Next, the minis don't fit together if they're all crammed into a single hex, which will start becoming a common occurrence later in the game if you got dudes kitted out for melee and you're just rushing to boss them once you're already powerful and don't need to power up anymore. What makes this even 
even worse is that you're also probably using your Hunter's Corrupted version, which I do tend to have even bigger minis. Remember though, that there is a four mini per space limit rules wise. So things can never get ludicrously out of line, but like, come on, these bosses are massive and throwing on even like one to two hunters doesn't even really fit. I can't even imagine what this is going to be like with four players, which also sounds horrible for board clarity, not just for what's in what hacks, but also because as a game with big minis, it's pretty easy for them to block vision for something smaller behind them. Not to mention that sometimes due to randomized setup that can affect the environment, you might end up putting even more minis onto the map. Oh, and these random environment setup components, while cool, have to be given special consideration in the rulebook because first of all, their inclusion necessitates a section in the components list that notes what they're used for. Just like, not gonna lie, at first I was confused about how they would come into play. Like I could guess that structures like a well or a carriage might show up from random environment setup, but like what the hell is a busy token? Thought I might have been missing some gameplay rule or something, but nope, it popped up from a map environment card. Defense tokens should all just be the same size and have different sides for two and four instead of having a bunch of small twos and big fours. Here's the reasoning. First, it's more convenient to be able to grab any defense token and know that you're good to go. Second, it better conveys that you only have one defense token slot, because at first, I was kind of confused if I was allowed to put in two tokens here because they do fit and the rulebook didn't make this the most clear because there was a part saying plural tokens, another was singular, but whatever, prototype rulebook. Point is, even without rulebook clarity, you could also just make this component clarity by making the slot only able to fit one defense token. Third, there's effects that say discard defense two, which you are allowed to discard a defense four with. Yes, that's really how that works. You can't turn your defense four into a defense two to meet the requirement. Okay, at that point, why isn't the text just saying discard a defense token, which would also be unga bunga obvious if your single defense token could either be a two or a four. Like the only downside I can think of for making the defense tokens different size is that if you settle on a bigger sized token, slotting a defense token into a minion maybe gets a little more annoying because they normally only ever get the small defense twos, but honestly, that seems pretty negligible. Also, while we're on the topic of defense tokens, this is probably more a gameplay con, but why does a Technomancer starting item Steam Armor have the effect to gain a defense two token if you already have one? Is that not confusing as hell for newcomers? Because for this to be useful, you got to have two different defense slots already, which you won't until you get new cards. So isn't that intuitively already getting new players to think that you can put multiple defense two tokens in your singular starting slot? Or even to turn a defense two into a defense four? But also, like, why is there a starting action that's extremely inefficient, borderline unusable without level ups in the first place? That's three icons for one damage at base. Like, oh, what the fuck? Next token to complain about is the tactics token looks way too similar to its picture in the player board. For some reason, every time we clean this game up, people keep forgetting to take this out, which is telling me it blends in a little too well and needs to have something to distinguish it just a bit more. Maybe like a different colored border or something to that effect. Then when it comes to dice, late game, it's pretty feasible to get to a point where you're rolling like 10 dice all at once. And at that point, it's kind of an issue to get them all in your hand at once. Not really sure if there's a solution to that that isn't redesigning the game around having less actions that are more impactful instead of the current philosophy of having a bajillion small actions, but this is a consequence and one that is more annoying if you have a smaller table because you really don't want to roll all these into any game pieces like the minis or anyone else's dice and change the results or even your own dice if you're rolling them into groups. Map tiles are annoying to set up at the moment because they aren't labeled. Yes, those numbers aren't map tile names, they're instead minion spawn placements and they got weird non-standard shapes. Because of this, if you look at setup instructions until you're more familiar with all the map art, it's super hard to tell what goes where because when looking at the picture, you can't really see what individual tiles the final map is comprised of. And yes, duh, this is jank because prototype. But even in final release, I feel like it's going to be hard to have clean setup conveyance even with labels due to the weird shapes because like, are there going to have to be two pictures? One that shows a tile spread apart and then another that's the actual map. Of course, none of this matters if map setup is more randomized in the final product instead of these strict scenario map setups. However, this isn't even mentioning that weirdly shaped map tiles don't stack well and are really annoying to put back into the box as a result. For the environment cards that slot into the map tiles, there's an issue where unlike the environment cards that place stuff right onto the map, like the tokens and minis, the cards that are just cards only affecting one space have a tendency to be forgotten, not just because they have more basic effects, but also because they're pretty out of the way and hard to see for all players. Like if there's an environment card that's on a far away edge and it's sideways, chances are you're going to forget about it when deliberating over your turn possibilities. That or you literally 
really can't see it because the minis are blocking it. Gonna keep talking about cards, I guess. Boss stage backs need some boss art on them. They aren't immediately recognizable from each other. Boss events need to look way more distinct from regular events. Obviously, you can't make them have a different card back because they go into a centralized event deck that pulls in cards from different setup sources. So I'll make the front side have like small boss art in the corner or put like a color-coded banner underneath the event type label. Fuck it, do that for the other types of events too. Items and deputy hunter cards could also use some help in the immediately distinguishable department. Their backsides are fine, not exceptional, could use a little something more, but the front sides could really use something super duper obvious that tells you which hunter it belongs to and if it's a deputy card or a regular level up card. Deputy, by the way, is the solo mode version. And this is especially the case with any of the double-sided starting item cards that can flip. Because if these ever get mixed up, you could have a very hard time figuring out which hunter it belonged to. Put like a little gun icon there or something in the corner. Anything, please. Gameplay cons. Okay, here's a big one. Grim Coven's difficulty drops off significantly once the elite is dead. Like, it's a very snowball-y experience at the moment. So a lot of the incoming threat is unfortunately front-loaded. The boss isn't going to get stronger AI cards, though they can get stronger from their stage deck. Minions spawn only so often, and the elite doesn't even respawn at all. Plus, the elite hits almost as hard as the boss, so once that's gone, you have so much more free reign on the map to move around safely when there aren't two mega threats running around. And minions? Well, they're minions. You can either just create space for yourself by killing them rather easily, they're also really easy to run away from, and you can even accept a few hits from them here and there. Not a big deal, they're minions. Furthermore, because you earn lament from killing things, the game is intrinsically swingy in that enemy's power level decreases and yours increases simultaneously whenever you make progress in the game state. Obviously, you're not really going to feel this from killing a few minions, especially since they only award lament to the killer, but the elite and boss grant lament to all hunters the value depicted on the bottom right of whatever you just removed. You remove a boss card, boom, tons of lament for everyone. Though, boss didn't really get weaker because all you did was thin a card from its deck. It still takes its turns as normal, just more consistently, which can be both good and bad. But if you remove the elite, boom, tons of lament for everyone. And you basically just cut potential incoming damage by almost half. Like, I think so far, every game has felt like if we could kill the elite by round two or three, if we were playing safely, so it was fine being slow, we were gonna end up winning that game. Because in the early game process of pinging the boss to break focus while dedicating actual damage towards the elite, you're also probably moving around, grabbing some lament off the ground, maybe you picked up some treasure laying around, and what ends up happening is once the elite is dead, your hunters both simultaneously have gotten a few levels, and the baddies got a lot weaker. And a few levels for you represents your turns being so much more powerful than what you started out with. Usually everyone's gonna start with four action dice, so each additional dice is a pretty notable increase in action efficiency. Like looking at, I don't know, four phases, which for a point of reference is one whole cycle of the boss's time track progressing so it hits a new stage card. Imagine the difference in doing 16 actions across that time because you stuck with your starting four dice per phase before you pass, versus even like 24 or 28 actions across that time. Like adding in extra actions really starts to hit big strides. Now imagine that over the course of the whole game, because I think usually my games last around seven phases, because it kind of feels like a crapshoot whether or not the boss is able to flip over two stage cards. Not only that with your action dice efficiency, you get a lot more consistent in doing what you want to be able to do because you're rolling so many dice and you probably added only the colors you need. But you also corrupted your hunter and flipped your board for even more power in the form of bypassing costs altogether. All of the corrupted hunters have ways to essentially cheat out even more actions than just their dice count. The gunslinger gets to load extra damage bullets out of nowhere just for existing instead of spending dice to reload. The technomancer gets another free dice because fuck it, why not? Oh, and they can move like crazy without using their regular actions. Duality is, I, I don't even know, this is pretty absurd being able to refresh your actions and dice because while this ain't no infinite, it greatly extends how long you can go before running out of action since every action you take essentially counts as 50% towards a refund. Now, granted, you do need to spend some of those level ups getting new cards so you have more actions to put your treasure trove of dice on, so I'm not saying that every time you get stronger you're just getting more dice, but what I am trying to say is that you scale so much harder than the boss does. Like, I'm talking getting to the point where you're removing both of the boss attack cards in one hunter's phase levels of strong and still having actions left over to position safely. Consistently, too. When you get that strong, pretty much the instant you flip, the randomness of the dice allocation barely even feels like it matters. Because, like, maybe if you're lucky slash unlucky with the double icons or how even the wrong icons popping up, across that many dice, that's really only going to change your action efficiency by, like, a handful in either direction. Meanwhile, getting lucky slash unlucky with your rolls early on when you only have four dice feels game-changing. Like, the 
difference in being able to go all out and do like three damage in the first turn, don't laugh, that's a lot at that point in the game, and rolling shit where you basically only get to move around makes such a huge difference in getting that early elite kill. But if you're doing like 10 damage on average a turn late game, the difference in doing like eight or 12 isn't that big of a deal. So yeah, Grim Coven is hard until it isn't. Like a lot of the challenging excitement only really lasts in the first half of the game. And then afterwards, smooth sailing. The only exception to this is if the early game was fucked and then after stabilizing once you're going later into the game, it's still interesting because everyone is like one hit away from dying. So you still got to really lock in because like, obviously you're still really powerful and you have the tools to perfectly deal with everything, but any one mistake and you die. And you might be thinking, wait, I thought you said if you're really high on the corruption track, bad stuff starts happening. Can't that add to the incoming threat levels? True, but there's a pretty fundamental issue with the track. And it's that when you gain lament on your board, you can choose to put as much of it as you want onto the track during all the hunter upkeep. This means that realistically, you probably just sit tight at like, I don't know, 13 corruption because you're already plenty powerful at that point with your six level ups. And maybe you got extra from random sources like treasure, environment cards, even other corruption cards, because you can actually lose corruption at lower levels, which is strictly good because this doesn't make you lose anything you gained from powering up. Point is, you don't really feel incentivized to go to the stupid high amounts of corruption that start getting the really bad corruption deck cards. Like, look at this track. Most of the level ups are crammed into the first half. But once you flip, instead of powering up every two corruption, it starts taking three, four corruption instead. That is so much more effort for so little gain. Like, if I'm sitting on eight action dice and three extra action cards, it's really not a big difference to get one more card or die. Now, if you're familiar with Cthulhu Death May Die, that game has an insanity track that's very similar to this corruption track. The difference, though, is that in Death May Die, you always feel incentivized to power up because the placement of the unlock points are reversed. You get stronger much slower early on, but later, you level up super duper fast, and it's exhilarating, but also terrifying, because even though you're leveling up literally every step of the way towards the end, if you hit that end, you're fucking donezo. Plus, you're getting most of your insanity from getting hit by monsters, so it's way less controllable than in Grim Coven, where maxing out is literally a choice, which really doesn't convince me that your hunters are getting blood drunk and losing control of themselves from the lament. Another big difference between how these two games do this good but also bad for you track is that Grim Coven has really incremental power increases and lots of them, whereas Death May Die has pretty big power-ups, but less of them. It's kind of hard to notice each time you grow in Grim Coven, but every two or three times? Oh yeah you feel the power. However, like I explained already, this works against incentivizing pushing you up further on the corruption track because why would you want to level up multiple times that deep in when it's just going to hurt you more? So what I think are great means of restructuring power scaling would be to have less level ups overall. Spread them out a little more evenly or put more of them towards the end and make each level up you have get a new card and a new die instead of choosing one or the other. Of course, this does weaken your early game, but that can always be adjusted by just toning down the boss and having their boss stage cards be more impactful. Or just have the elite spawn in later instead of being there right from the start. This would also make the game slightly less fiddly with leveling up downtime, because right now, if you ever pull off a nuts hunter's round and everyone has enough lament for multiple level ups all at once, there can be a lot of deliberation when looking at two cards and thinking about if you want to pick one or a die three times in a row. Versus, oh, you just get a die, don't even have to think about it, then just pick a card and do that less often. Now, if we're trying to be as thematic as possible, I'd argue these stronger rebalancing here would be to put all those levels towards the end because if you want to encourage players doing certain behavior, you got to reward it. And seemingly a big part of Grim Coven is the wacky hijinks that happens only at high corruption level. Especially this shit called Final Perdition, where being at max corruption may give you a secret card that puts you on a timer towards transforming into a boss yourself. That's cool as fuck. And it should really be something that happens semi-naturally. Like, you shouldn't have to go out of your way to try to make that happen. It should be right on the cusp, where at the end game you're really close to a disastrous transformation, but you can usually control the situation enough from fully getting there. But then, with a simple push, because you're curious and want to see it, or because you messed up, boom! Max corruption. Uh-oh, your end can come at any moment now, but the boss is so close to being dead. Oh fuck, oh fuck, oh fuck, that's the vibes we're looking for. Oh, and another thing that makes players not want to get more corruption is simply if they're at low health. And guess what? Because so much threat is front-loaded, that can feasibly happen in the process of killing a bunch of elites and minions before you stabilize the game state enough to take on the boss. 
boss. Like, if everyone's flipped their boards and are still finding themselves close to death, unless you desperately need more power, which again, you probably don't, getting higher on the track only risks doing more damage to each other when you draw corruption cards during upkeep. Anyways, enough with the botched hunter evolution segment, let's talk about the boss behavior. So once you're strong enough to reliably delete a boss attack card every hunter's phase and the elite is dead, there's nothing stopping the gameplay loop of just being super familiar with their boss response card. This is because every turn you delete the attack card and then move out of the way of their response. That's really dull gameplay, especially if the boss doesn't even move as part of its response because you're just wailing on a stationary target that basically isn't even doing anything threatening. Definitely got an issue where the game feels great at first, but then towards the end, the boss just kind of falls over and dies. Like, it feels like there should be something going on that changes the response every now and then. I don't know, maybe have like three boss response cards underneath this turn's attack, and every time you remove an attack card, you also remove a boss response, so it changes regularly. Hopefully that isn't too fiddly. And if we're looking to make the boss response more difficult to react to, unfortunately, they'd either need to be really powerful or hidden information, because right now you're supposed to always know how the boss responds. Here's a goofy idea. What if the backside of every attack card was a different response, so you just flip the card whenever you break it? I mean, I guess you could still memorize everything, but like there could also be multiple copies of attacks with different responses on the back. That does sound like an absurd amount of work, though. Moving from boss response to the boss's final action, not gonna lie, I rarely saw the boss ever get to do these. Because it's so common for the final phases of the game to go like this. You delete the penultimate attack card, boss does its turn, and the response whiffs, as usual. Then the boss attacks all flow down, but now final action is revealed, and because enough attack cards are removed, there's no discard pile, so it triggers and places itself. Then, when it comes back to the hunter's turns, you guys all burst down the final attack card and simply win on the spot. Like, I don't know, 15 health is the most I've seen, and it's pretty easy for each hunter to be doing 7, 8 damage if you got access to refreshes or stocked up on whatever your hunter's resource gimmick is. I mean, fuck, one time I had Duality do 15 damage on their own, using this judgment attack twice for 10 of it, thanks to refreshing it, and the rest from other attacks and Thorns of Darkness. Again, going back to the power scaling point, if the final action was particularly juiced, and hunters really needed to go deeper into corruption to tackle it, that'd be sick. Final stand would be way more epic, there's your tense, big climactic finish. Also, minion spawning is really easy to play around, because they show up in these set numbers on the map based on how much are left in reserve. So like, if there's three minions out and you have to spawn in four more, you put them in four, five, six, and seven. This means that you know exactly where they come out and when, which results in you being able to perfectly play around this, especially since they don't typically act the instant they spawn. So if you have multi-attacks, you can plant yourself in the midst of them and clear them out with ease. Really feels like their spawn placement needs to be more dynamic somehow. Granted, not dealing with them lets them get out of control pretty quickly. But even then, they'll tend to group up as they're chasing someone down, and they can't move as far as the boss, meaning you can kite them fairly easily. Which leads me to one of the craziest sources of distancing yourself from enemies, these portals. Frankly, these are extremely powerful because how they work is that they're considered adjacent to each other only for the hunters. However, the only way to move through them is with the sprint action instead of any movement. Essentially, they make kiting enemies an infinite possibility because even once they corner you, you can just teleport to the other side of the map, rinse and repeat. Of course, that relies on having consistent access to sprint, which is primarily the green die. But all this really does is encourage everyone to pick a couple up at some point because movement is extremely important in this game. And just FYI, the green die is by far the most generically useful die color because its offhand symbol is the magic star. So even though it primarily allows sprinting, which is the most important aspect, it also can let you cleanse even if you don't roll sprint. Doesn't mean you should just stack greens and forget about it. I'm saying that every solid build in this game has a few greens and then the rest of the dice are dedicated towards the actual build. But yeah, enemies really need a way to interact with the portals because with good movement and focus management on the hunter's end, I've seen them not take any damage for extremely long stretches of time. Which is cool that you can do that, but it feels like it needs to be harder to achieve instead of just killing the elite and some minions, and now suddenly the boss is just fruitlessly chasing you around. Or maybe the portals need to have some sort of drawback, or limited uses, or cooldowns available on rotation, something, anything that helps make Sprint not just clearly one of the best actions in the game for allowing hunters to control the game state so oppressively against the enemies. Moving out of the way feels significantly more safer than using defense tokens 
tokens to prevent damage. Which, if that's the intention and defense should be a last resort, good job! But running real good is extremely strong for being able to deal damage in complete safety when ideally it should be something like mostly total safety. Okay, time to move on to the roguelike descriptor of this game. First, when it comes to your starting item cards, you're allowed to choose what you start with from these six cards. One weapon and one armor. There were some pretty clear winners here, or at least very clear combos that should be picked, which isn't very roguelike. And yes, I know this is a prototype, but apparently the final release plans to also only have six item cards, so uh... Because ideally, there'd be significantly more starter cards, like 10 weapons and 10 armor minimum, and then you draw three, pick one from each. But even then, that would probably result in some cards that you'd never pick. So I'd even support just getting random starting cards, and then you pick whatever die you want so as to not cause dysfunctional builds. But then, like, at that point, why even have starting cards? Why not just randomly get two of the unlock cards? And if there's no way to do damage, you're allowed to redraw until you can. Because if I'm being honest, while playing, it very quickly stops feeling like you're doing these attacks that are from your weapons. Everything just kind of feels like you're throwing out some random bullshit goal with the exception of the gunslinger because it's common for them to still be attacking with their starting item card late game because of how their extra cards may just be them getting more bullets to buff their starting item attack instead of getting more attacks. Technomancer and Duality late game, however, almost never do their starting actions. I'd argue that if you're trying to make the game feel like you're actually using items instead of a bunch of random extra attack abilities, item cards need to be way more impactful and these newfound upgrades shouldn't be stronger than them. And for the next roguelike aspect, the randomized environment cards, it generally feels like they aren't impactful enough and you can always just do your same old gameplay patterns. On average, they're fine as they are, because like if you get nothing but a bunch of cards that slot into a hex and now it does something slightly helpful, that's like, okay, sure, whatever. But then like, even if you do get the cool shit that puts stuff on the board, it's too often that it can or should just be ignored entirely. Like I talked about how cool it is that a carrot can pop up and it gives you an escort mission. Like, oh wow, does that throw you for a loop? But I never actually completed that task. Because as it turns out, hauling ass across the whole board is kind of dangerous. And I very quickly just went back to a kiting gameplay where I'm sprinting back and forth between portals instead of running through the middle, putting myself in danger. Not to mention, these environment actions tend to be pretty unreliable for needing specific icons. Because one, you're probably doing a build for something specific, so if it doesn't line up, can't interact with it. Two, there better be a good benefit to spend a move to go out of your way to do those environment thingies instead of your build, even if it does line up. And three, the value proposition of using actions to hurt enemies and removing incoming threat is a really high bar to clear, especially with how cognizant you have to be to enemy behavior so that you can move away from them accordingly, usually to a portal and not to a random map edge with an environment card. And remember, the ones that slot into a hex have to be on a map edge, because how else would you put a card under a hex? So unless that edge is like right next to a portal, it's going to be hard to interact with if you still want to be safe with an escape plan. In short, a lot of circumstances need to line up for most environment cards to feel impactful, besides needing the actual environment effect to be strong. Because yeah, like Holy Grounds is great. I might run out of my way to do that. But Abandoned Shrine? Needing a Lament and a Heal is such an oddly specific combo because you're usually going to need more of one or the other. Plus, it needs you to give up a Sprint icon, and that's pretty premium. But who knows? Part of this might just be a side effect of how early game you probably should be completely ignoring these and just killing the elite to snowball the game state in your favor because everything's impact just kind of pales in comparison to that. And then once the elite is dead, usually all you're going to want from environments is healing. Environments also pale in comparison to picking up treasure tokens from moving onto them, which don't cost any actions and provide insanely big benefits like fat heals or even power-ups like an extra die. Not only are they a lot more reasonable to go super out of your way to move on, but because they don't cost any actions, it also means you are able to still use your dice to attack stuff or even just run back to where you need to be after getting the treasure, which is super efficient in comparison to environments. Finally, the solo mode feels significantly weaker than just playing two regular hunters. So how this works is you got a regular hunter, but then there's also a deputy you control with simpler actions and no dice, just these action markers. Nice! A great premise for solo play, or if Awakened Realms expanded on this, deputies could also be used to bring in someone less experienced with board games, so basically Oathsworn's companion system. Problem is, that deputy has only two actions for the whole hunter's phase. Holy shit, that's weak. Like, how are you supposed to do a reasonable turn of move and sprint and attack until some level ups? Which, by the way, they don't even have as much progression as a regular hunter. It also means that if you manage to lose corruption, it's significantly stronger than usual because level ups are so scarce.
matters. And if you're thinking, well, the game surely gets easier to compensate for this, right? Only very slightly, because you're still doing two-player difficulty, so anything that mentions player count obviously gets nerfed, like, for instance, spawning minions, but anything that's per hunter is still just as strong. It very much did not feel like I could ever control the game state well with a deputy. Like, early game, it was pretty much always a choice between doing damage or staying safe instead of both. It really feels like to get to a playable state, the deputy has to get lucky grabbing treasure that awards an additional die, which is converted into a marker. Plus, the regular hunter has to always feed the deputy an assist marker, which is how I won the second time with the deputy against Convergence, because the first time doing true solo, I got slaughtered by the undead general, because it feels like there's no way to get enough action efficiency to deal with the general, the elite, and minions when you're this limited. On top of all that, there's a bunch more random downsides tacked onto deputies. For starters, since they don't have dice with icons, they can't even interact with the environment, as if that mechanic needed another disincentive. Deputies also don't have a cleanse step because, again, no dice with magic star icon, so stun and burn are really painful on them. They also don't have a choice when it comes to putting lament onto their corruption. They have to put all of it. So come late game, if there's going to be someone who turns into a monster with their corruption cards, apparently it's the shitter rogue out of control goofball deputy. There is one upside, though, and it's that with a deputy, you don't have to perfectly sequence your turns with two actions back and forth. You can just weave in the deputy's actions whenever. But come on, I'd take having more actions and a tougher time sequencing them any day of the week if it means being able to consistently keep pace with the enemies. Recommender score! Tentative score! Normally here at Shelfside, we do the recommender score where we critically evaluate our pros and cons to give a score seeing how well the game did what it set out to do. In this case, a 1-4 to four player boss battler where you build your character in a roguelike fashion to go kill big bloodborne looking bosses. However, this is a prototype, and so instead it's gonna be a tentative score, because everything's subject to change. And so, the tentative score for Grim Coven is gonna be a N slash A, not available. Wait, what? Why? Well, the problem is that this prototype came out a little raw. It needed a little more time to cook. Like, there's too many burning questions I got about the final release, and I'm not expecting their prototype to be, like, a beta pre-release that's close to done. But what I am expecting is being able to see most of the game systems. Like, you might have noticed that throughout this review, I didn't mention the story whatsoever. Yeah, when you pick bosses to fight, there's little narrative blurbs and a whole-ass companion app with music and voiceover readings. The hunt doesn't start well as your quill hovers over the park. Granted, this isn't a campaign game because it's supposed to be a one-off, like, I don't know, Nemesis or most board games in general. But there are still things that are apparently supposed to exist between your games that just aren't here in the prototype. The story makes it very clear that you're supposed to fight a grief-bound boss multiple times before you can actually kill it. And I have literally no idea what that's supposed to look like because we're just given the first encounter with these two bosses. And remember when I was talking about Final Perdition, the big scary punishment slash payoff for hitting 20 corruption that might turn your hunter into a boss? That seems like a rather core part of the game. Also not here. So while I can talk about in the cons about how Grim Coven doesn't nearly incentivize you enough to keep upping your corruption, I can't even talk about one of the, I'd assume, primary ways to unlock more content with extra scenario bosses. Or what about multiplayer scaling? Don't know how that's gonna look, especially in a game system where you lose if even one person dies, which is kind of fundamentally already the case in 2P co-ops since that's half your efficacy loss, so you usually inevitably lose if one dude of two dies. But in 4P, that's only a fourth of your power down, so lots of other co-ops balance around that and have to be threatening in a more exponential manner than just linearly scaling difficulty up from 2P. But in Grim Coven, this difficulty sliding is going to look entirely different. Are there going to have to be two elites? Does everything just get more health? Fuck it. I'm guessing just giving enemies more health doesn't work as well because with four people positioning doesn't get contested as hard if there's the same amount of enemies. And when it comes to minions, you can't really give them more health without making them super fiddly, and I'd imagine minions become even more of a joke when you have four players worth of attacks. There's definitely gonna have to be more enemies, right? But then, how does that affect power scaling, especially for the elite and the boss who award lament globally when you kill them dead? How does that balance affect stuff you can pick up off the floor, such as treasures and lament, which already felt somewhat sparse for two-player? Meanwhile, on the roguelike descriptor of this game, I feel like I can't even comment on that as much as I'd like, 
because right now everyone has 10, 11 level up cards. So you always see all of them every game and can usually just pick your favorites, which isn't very roguelike. But then final release plans to have 25 of these cards per hunter. Endless replayability because you're doing different things every run is a huge selling point of roguelikes. And I didn't really get to experience it at all, especially because the more content you add, the more exponential the amount of different permutations of combos you can make. Like just look at the difference in components list on the game found front page versus what the prototype includes. And you know that that's just going to be the base game. Plus with add-ons or expansions, the amount of variety you could get here sounds crazy. Like this sheet Awaken Realm sent with what's planned feels so promising with 28 scenarios, eight hunters, seven bosses. I have a feeling Grim Coven is gonna be one of those games where just getting base game is aight, but then getting additional stuff makes it exponentially better because of how everything interacts with, well, with everything else in unexpected and interesting ways. Think like Cthulhu Death May Die, where it really needs more expansions to actually have lasting power, because otherwise you keep fighting the same bosses. Or, uh, like, what's a game we've actually reviewed? I can use that as an example. Uh, oh, Eldritch Horror. Yeah, because that game had such a small amount of events, bosses, characters, and fresh stuff that could happen with each boss, unless you bought more expansions, and then suddenly your mix and match potential grew exponentially. Point is, crazy variety in gameplay from builds and enemies sounds like it was supposed to be in the pros. But I can't comment on it yet because I'm usually just picking all the cards with highest damage and ability refresh capabilities, and I haven't really found any zany meme builds. Oh, wait, but back to the story bit, I forgot to mention they sent this parchment in a dip pen with red ink, which is the coolest shit ever. Again, not really sure how to evaluate this because I doubt it's included in the game and it's probably just a fun add-on. But I love stupid fun nonsense like this, and it was honestly a highlight to gather my friends around this contract and have everyone sign their names in blood to join the coven before we're listening to the narration app telling us all about how we signed the parchment and are now going to die. 10 out of 10 edgelord experience. I'd like to thank our hunters did the Grim Coven proud. Though, you know what that experience reminded me of, oddly enough? Oath, where you write in its history book. And it got me thinking that the concept of Grim Coven as a one-shot, ever-changing roguelike is gold. That is, Awakened Realms is sitting on actual pure gold. For context, Oath is a game that's like the antithesis of campaign games because it's an area control with a living world that permanently progresses and changes between games, much like a campaign game, but it's still a one and done because it's meant to make players feel history as a tangible concept just by playing the game and seeing how their actions ripple through time. No two games of Oath play the same, and you can pretty much look at any aspect of the gameplay once you're a few games in and know there's a story behind it that you as the players made through emergent gameplay. Do you kind of see where I'm going with this? If Grim Coven becomes the Oath of Boss Battlers, I personally think that concept melts together incredibly well for a truly one-of-a-kind game we've never seen before. Imagine, if you will, that every time you play a game of Grim Coven, the game gives you a notepad that you can sign before every game. Now, I didn't mention this before, but the game has a bounty board where you have a bunch of cards of the bosses you're allowed to hunt. Again, prototype jank, there wasn't really a reason to use this because all the stuff that happens in between games doesn't exist yet. So imagine, if you will, that every time you sign that notepad, you can also weave your own story in via the characters you all signed in as. So you sign, pick a bounty, follow the narration app, do the boss battle, narration app again, possibly unlock more bounties. Then, after every hunt, say there's a rule for who gets to continue writing in that notepad to detail how the hunt went down. I don't know, make it the person who has the most health left or something. That way, even if you win or lose, it's a consistent rule that makes sense. You now have a personal retelling tied to your Grim Coven world that makes it feel so much more living and breathing when you see hunt book story text like this, where it tells you you need to learn a lesson from your fellow hunter's death, or for when one of you transforms into a boss themselves. Like, just imagine how cool it would be if you have records of when your friend who keeps signing every hunt as John Hunter or Absolute Giga Chat as he slaughters a bunch of grief bound, only to end up becoming one himself. And later on, when you look at that bounty board to pick one of the hunts you've unlocked and you see the one for a corrupted gunslinger that your friend kept playing as back when he used to sign as John Hunter, that shit hits you hard. It makes you want to pour one out for your boy and send him off in his final hunt. Does that not sound amazing? No need to make characters or do any campaign busy work, you just have everyone sign the coven with whatever name they want, same or different, doesn't matter. And then write whatever bullshit narrative you want afterwards, and now suddenly you've got everyone feeling like they're actually a part of the Grim Coven. Thank you for listening to my PSA as to why I think a notepad should be included in the game alongside some elements that carry over between games but don't actually cause any campaign-like bookkeeping so that if there's an add-on for a dip pen, ink bottle, and a contract notepad, it makes way more sense as a deluxe component. Of course, that's not what the game is at the moment, but the reason why I bring that up is because Grim Coven has massive potential if they change course in the
the ways I've just listed and in the cons. Like, sure, the game could be really good as is if they fixed essentially what are just balance issues I've described, because the fundamental mechanics work well as puzzly input randomness gameplay, but man, it could be something so, so special with that extra push. So yeah, that's where I'm at with this prototype, because it's in a weird spot, and if you were to force me to rate it as is, I'd probably be like a 6 out of 10 above average, but I don't think that's really representative of the final game, just like this prototype is currently not that representative of the final game too. And I'd summarize that 6 out of 10 score as, yeah, right now the game's just fine, so average. But then the components are so good that it pushes it up a bit. But if you ask me to isolate only the core gameplay and treat the prototype as more of a foundational proof of concept and less of evaluating the whole picture with the promised roguelike tons of build crafting that's currently missing, it'd be like a 7 out of 10 good because at its core, the first half of every fight is really tense. The action system and corruption track are working in tandem to produce interesting dilemmas. But then late game, it starts tapering off, which basically means if you fix the progression and balance everything up a bit, it easily goes to an 8 or 9. But again, none of those are, in my opinion, good ways of evaluating Grim Coven. Because the true experience, and what would make it exceptional, is that blend of gameplay and roguelike progression and seeing how all those extra factors play into the core combat system. Okay, enough yapping. What about the golden question? Should you back Grim Coven? If you're interested in its mechanics and like the aesthetic, I think it's a solid purchase. Let me explain why. First, despite all the gameplay cons I mentioned hitting pretty hard into some rather essential elements of the game's core systems, there's nothing rocky about the mechanics foundation of Grim Coven with like maybe the exception of solo gameplay. I'm basically saying rules don't have to be changed, but definitely some sweeping balance shifts. So I don't know, it's probably a need to change around a lot of numbers. And who knows, maybe that's enough to buff the deputy without changing its rules. And considering that Awakened Realms have been pretty good about listening to feedback, I would be more surprised if they didn't take these criticisms and improve the game with them. Probably in more thought out and better ways than I suggested, because I don't have a team of playtesters on hand. Of course, do know I am more biased about potential fixes, considering that I feel extremely validated about how all their tainted grail changes went down, since they did in fact address like the vast majority of cons mentioned across my tainted grail videos that they could in fact reasonably change. What I mean by that is there's of course going to be some stuff that's just too fundamental at this point and can't be addressed without extreme overhauls. Like, I don't see them removing corruption as a mechanic at this point, but I can see a rebalancing. If we look to a past example, such as Tainted Grail, we voiced some foundational concerns about multiplayer and why we think it's best at one to two players. But you can't really make it better for three to four players without some serious foundational shifts, so its multiplayer issues are kind of just baked into the design at this point. But then for a ton of other aspects of the Tainted Grail formula, like character balancing, they definitely fixed the fuck out of those. Oh yeah, I also saw that in Kings of Ruin, they actually have divider cards and a better insert for all those different card types. So I have no doubt that they can take what they've learned from that and also deliver good organization built into Grim Coven. Second, assuming all the listed components still holds true in the final version and the balance cons are addressed, this is some quality amount of gameplay you're looking at for 60 bucks. Obviously though, if you're looking for more replayability, you should get more add-ons and whatnot, but like, if you're most people who have a massive collection and this is just another fun one-off game to play that you're realistically only going to pull out like a handful of times, the base game offering is more than enough for that. And then of course, if you bling out with deluxe components and minis, Awaken Realms absolutely crushes it on that end every time. Like, goddamn, does Grim Coven have good table presence. And finally, third, I want to make it crystal clear that I am really confident there's no way this game ends up being mid or outright bad. Like, at worst, I see it being pretty good, but not exceptional. And at best, crossing my fingers, this hopium isn't copium, Grim Coven definitely has the makings to become something truly special. Like, the pieces are all there. I see it. If it all comes together, there's something magical here, and I can see it shooting up BGG's rankings akin to like Cthulhu Death May Die, but the boss battler version. But for those of you on the fence, I'll dial it back a bit, because this ultimately all rides on how much you trust Awaken Realms to deliver that good, good gameplay. Not going to try to convince you further, make do with the game information and my analysis that you will, because the earlier bit is definitely more useful for people who look at the box art and immediately soil themselves while screaming, Bloodborne! And now they're frantically searching up information about Grim Coven, praying to God that the gameplay isn't bad. What I will say for the ones stuck on the fence is that I do apologize if this review seems rushed because there's like no sick edits or if you were looking for more conclusive information that the prototype just unfortunately doesn't provide. Because I feel you. I feel the same way because I was really curious to see how the hunters becoming boss fights mechanics looked like. For context, I know this is some meta shit outside the game, but like this whole Grim Coven coverage feels really fast paced. Like I had basically only two weeks to make this review, which is not a lot of time if you've watched our video on how we make reviews. So I've basically been nonstop working and frantically trying to get 
people together to play, which is really hard because motherfuckers actually have nine to five jobs. So overall, just felt more jank making this video because there was a Google Doc rulebook that's pretty rough and I had to email like 20 something questions to the Grim Coven dev team, which bless their hearts, they're great people and were really helpful. But the point I'm trying to say is that in comparison to the Kings of Ruin prototype where I had like, I think three, maybe four weeks, it's a pretty huge difference production wise. Like Kings of Ruin's prototype just felt so much more cohesive in his presentation while this was giving duct tapes together vibes because wow, there's a lot of errors I didn't bring up in cons from this being a prototype. There's a bunch of boss attacks we got that aren't used for some reason. We were even mailed a separate letter that had updated player aids. Also, I asked Ashton if he felt similarly about Dragon Eclipse, and he said, yeah, that workflow was really fast too. So I don't know, it might just be the result of Awakened Realms being quite a large lad with tons of people working there now, so they're just cranking out project after project. If you have a bigger company with a ton of people, you can't just have them sitting around between projects because then you're burning money. So maybe like if in one game, the artists aren't doing anything at the moment, so they need to get moved to another game to be productive. There you go. That's why there needs to be a ton of games. I don't know. I'm just spitballing because like something about the vibes just feels a little different and I can't quite place my finger on it between the brisk speed, more jank, the art direction feeling more all over the place because like the cover art screams Bloodborne, but then you got like a Dark Souls general and whatever the heck duality is. Like it definitely all looks cool as hell, but the vibes feel a little off. Maybe from a bunch of different people coming in with different aesthetic visions or something. With all that being said, I have a hilarious take where I think that if Grim Coven gets delayed, that's a good sign that's going to be one of Awakened Realm's biggest bangers. And the more timely its release date is, the less spectacular it gets. Ultimately, my mindset right now is pretty full bloomer. I have high hopes for Grim Coven and wish nothing but the best for their dev team so that we get the best version of Grim Coven possible. Ashton's personal, personal score. Personal score. For my personal score, I gave Grim Coven a 9 out of 10. I think it's excellent. Wait, is excellent 9 out of 10? Fuck, why don't I remember anything? I think the game has a way of making everything feel really unique and really impactful and I felt so connected to different parts of the game that I thought it was absolutely amazing to play. I think that the progression system for each of the different hunters is really, really cool. Uh, I find that the hunters, the asymmetry is one of my favorite parts in the game. It feels like the hunters are unique, but not so unique that it has to get explained, like each hunter has to get explained separately. The fact that you get to flip halfway through the game uh, is also really interesting. It allows you to play like just an upgraded character and the fact that it gets you a different model is really, really cool. So I played uh, two scenarios. I played both at the same time. First time we lost, second time we won. First time, or both times I played as Technomancer, um, who as a character I think is just really interesting. Getting the extra die uh, is really good good and then having to figure out how to play because that die almost entirely gets used uh, to unlock all your armor and having to figure out around that little puzzle is really helpful because sometimes it might just be more useful to move than to trigger your armor and then you like plan out this entire sequence of actions and you get to the final sequence and you realize ah I can't use that extra die to move I need to use it for this like this action just to activate the rest of my armor or weapons, which I think is really, really big. I, I found that, like, you know, having to fight the boss alongside having to fight all of the minions and everything and the elite was really interesting because I could, um, like, I had to plan around moving across the map, which as a Technomancer, moving is pretty easy, but I had to help, um, my friend was playing as Gunslinger, and I had to help him move around the map a little bit uh, here and there because it was like optimal to play. It was really optimal to, be able to like jump around the map and try and avoid the boss, but you can kind of take a few hits here and there, which I thought like just felt very like, practical if that makes sense okay uh, the damage dealt by the boss is a lot but it doesn't always kill you so you can take like one or two hits from the boss maybe one or two hits from the boss and not die even though healing is difficult and all that's difficult you can still take a little bit of like damage from the boss and not just die which is really big because it makes the boss feel like it's not just a game of avoiding like i have to tactically come in there deal some damage, maybe risk taking a little bit of damage and then going away, but I can at least make that decision. Like I can make that risk assessment uh, rather than just like in uh, Aeon Trespass Odyssey, for example, like you just kind of can't get hit. You just have to make sure you're out of way of the boss or else you're just screwed. But I think the boss having like two to three different like uh, action sequences to worry about feels like I'm always like uh, kept on my toes about something. So first I have to keep track of the track, like, you know, whether or not he's going to drop like a, a new event and keeping track of the events is another thing to keep track of, right? And then I have to keep track of the boss, like whether or not it's going to evolve into a new stage. And the boss stages are really, really damaging sometimes. 
Um, and then the attack card track, where I have to keep track of both the current attack that the boss is about to do, and the next attack that the boss is going to do afterwards. And do I want to spend the effort to, like, you know, deal a little bit of damage now to prevent the the focused version of the boss attack, or do I want to, like, you know, save that damage for the next card because I know I'll be able to destroy the next card? Like all of these different little tracks, and then the banners too. Uh, the boss having these three banners that like all interact with the minions. Um, and I think the the three banners, like they they make it so that every single time he spawns minions they become a really pervasive threat and like all of that's just like little bits of damage but it really adds up and importantly it makes it so that your positioning has to be really precise and there's also this one card where the boss just kind of teleports to you and deals unblockable damage another thing that like you know regardless of your positioning you have to deal with where the minions are and you have to deal with where the boss is going to be and potentially where the elite is so like there's a lot of pieces of advice here where like you know killing the elite fast is really good but it might not be feasible because you need to deal two damage to the boss so that he doesn't do his focused version of the attack but you might also need to deal with the elite quickly because if you get too close to the elite then he's going to launch an attack that's a bit more powerful so you can't get to the boss and there's all of these different things to manage and i i think i just really like games like that uh everything was just a threat there's just a lot of damage that i was just taking that was really difficult for me to block and shield from also the enemy that we faced was the alchemist I think and um, he had this ability to burn you and burn is just like such an interesting mechanic in here because you can stack it so it's not just like wound in, in uh, Gloomhaven or Frosthaven where you know you can only have one wound you take one damage a turn here it's just like it keeps stacking and that added pressure and I think actually uh, yeah both the boss elite and the minion burned you so that interaction between all those different burns meant that I pretty much had to like use an action once every turn or once every two turns to make sure I cleanse myself of the boot burns and that sort of like it felt like there were a lot of different timers on the game right and if i didn't keep track of all of them it would drag me down really quickly and that's another thing that this game does really well where i have this corruption track to worry about i have my health to worry about i have the number of action die that i have to worry about uh, i have like these stun tokens to worry about and then i have to worry about the boss's timer track itself because it's got this four point timer circle uh where it, it can evolve to a new stage it spawns minions at some point and then i have to worry about this like like all of these different timers where like it's just a lot of things to manage so uh, even though this game could be prone to quarterbacking it feels like spirit island in that it's really helpful for me to know everyone else's abilities but it's not entirely necessary and even if i do know everyone else's abilities i kind of am more stuck to just saying like okay can you deal this amount of damage here or can you do this here do you think you can deal with this for me and to me that feels a lot more tactical than just like either me quarterbacking entirely or someone else quarterbacking entirely or you know just having everything kind of predetermined so that definitely was a big improvement for me where i could you know kind of tactically speak in like broad overviews be like oh i think it would be a good idea for us to draw the enemies this way and then deal some damage this way and then i know as soon as the game kind of facilitates me into talking like naturally kind of facilitates me into talking in these sort of broader tactical terms and i know i'm going to enjoy it because it's not just me going into like nitty-gritty game mechanics it's me talking like overviews as like a hunter you know uh, i think the time length uh ran potentially a little bit long for me where i i think i wish that like past a certain point it shifted from you having to deal with minions because i think the last minion spawn kind of just felt like more of a nuisance than anything so i think maybe time length i think maybe i just I think ashton and i agree too much on this where sometimes time length for a lot of games is just a bit too long but for me in this game personally it just felt like maybe it was like two rounds too long at the end and i think adding a little bit of tightness either by reducing the boss's final health or re removing one card i think also for us we had something that added a boss attack card to the deck and that was really difficult because that just added a whole like you know few rounds to it so that might have also added to it specifically in our in our perception of it but i mean you know we were still kind of cutting it to the edge towards the end where like you know we were pretty low on health and um, I might have died if we couldn't pull out like one or two more damage really quickly and like I think I just barely survived by like moving out of the way of the boss and then uh, letting the gunslinger take a little bit of the damage so that tightness felt really really good I think as like a quick components thing all the components of this game felt really really good like the cards at least like meshed well together like they felt like they were continuing the piece of armor for Technomancer at least I thought the uh, the standing portals and stuff 
was really cool because it actually felt like like the map had this sort of more varied structure because I could jump from point to point a lot easier. Where in another game that uses like maybe that might use two dimensional tiles for that, um, it's just kind of like it doesn't feel the same in terms of like connecting the map together. The one thing that I think as like a tactile component, the health counters um, were a little bit like abstracted maybe for me, like the the damage counter sitting on there. I almost always forgot what health I was at because it was just kind of a pile of counters that just sat there in the corner as opposed to like a dial or something, but that's kind of just nitpicking. I mean, all the components are wonderful, obviously. Uh, and I think maybe the last thing to mention before I kind of summarize my thoughts, I think that the, the terrain is another part of this game that feels really cool. And the fact that the terrain gets pretty drastically updated. Like we never used the well in this scenario, but we did use one of the healing spots and the busy token, the busy uh, minions was a really good one too. And I think that like all of these little things make the terrain feel really alive. And, and I think that's one of the things that this game just does really, really well. I and mean, like the terrain characteristics is really cool. Cool. and then having the three-dimensional objects for both obstacles and for portals uh, just felt really good. The one thing is I think that the, the minis are just a little too big for the terrain, but that's, again, not a huge issue. And I'm sure it's because it's a prototype that, like, I really want the story to be cool. Uh, the story aspect of it, reading about the undead general, uh, both before and after, was really interesting and it made me just want to get into the story more and it just felt like oh this is a cool mystery that i want to better understand i guess in 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 summary of all of my thoughts i think the game has this like this ability to make things feel really unique and really important so i felt like you know the undead general just felt really really like meaningful the alchemist as an elite felt really meaningful the corrupted murderers um also felt really meaningful like everything in this game feels like it has character to it which is really big you know the fact that i can remember all of the um all of the different uh things that i fought and all the different terrain things like busy minions the well um like all of those different terrain things my character my partner's character like i played a game the day before that i thought was all right but honestly i just don't even remember my character's name i don't remember the name of the game like all of this stuff where like I could I could really feel like oh okay I feel connected to the to the game as a whole and I think that level of connection I haven't felt since a game like Frosthaven where I felt really deeply connected to my character and this guy like the character that I played was just like a guy that had like you know increasingly complicated armor that was all technologically based and that just felt like I was playing a character that really represented me in some extent uh, and I really liked that. Yeah, I think this game gave me a feeling that I haven't gotten from a game in a while and that everything genuinely felt unique and that's I think the biggest thing. I want to play more games like this. My personal score. All right, pure rambling time, all biases, no analysis. My personal enjoyment for this grim coven prototype is a six out of 10. I have an above average time with it. And if I'm being real, this really should be a 5 out of 10 average, but I just love the art and minis too much, so it jumps up in my book. The first time I played, I thought this shit was absolutely incredible. Like, the sense of discovery in this game is unbelievably fun. The first time I did a big, dumb, duality wombo combo, I was so fucking hyped. Like, pulling off any sort of really long sequence that involves some level of recursion and managing a specific resource is just so satisfying. However, because the prototype is lacking in content, that excitement dips off extremely quickly, which is why I'm so adamant about how the prototype isn't a good representation, because I can see myself getting lost in this game if I had access to way more enemies, events, environments, hunters, etc. I mean, I may not even need all that at once, because I'd honestly be pretty down to run through a bunch of unique scenarios with different enemies as the same guy because like that's still pretty fresh and is how most campaign games work since you play as the same character throughout but at the moment i'm seeing the same elite over and over again while there's such a big early game focus on it and the fights feel very samey because now that i'm familiar with all the hunter evolution cards and since you see all of them every time i'm running the same or similar things again and again against the same enemies while the environment doesn't change enough it also feels like i only get to see the boss do its cool unique boss stuff in the first half of the fight because like mentioned in the cons once you start removing a card every turn and perfectly play around the response card the boss really loses all its flavor all of that results in me currently having only an okay time while playing because like it ain't bad it's just dry but hey i had to play this many times so that i understood all the hunters both bosses and the solo mode for a more all-encompassing viewpoint of the game and its mechanics so 
It is what it is. And again, I'm gonna reiterate my tastes for like the millionth time at this point. Grim Coven is supposed to be right up my alley. I love tons of player interaction, very asymmetric characters, big bombastic table presence, and I love the theme because I'm someone who platinumed Bloodborne. I love input randomness. I also like tons of randomness, but just at low to medium levels of effect that you then have to react to, mull over, and think about how to navigate, all while there's a bajillion nonsense things happening everywhere from events and environments and whatnot to further deep in the puzzle. Like, Grim Coven really does check off a ton of my boxes. It's just that the prototype ain't really there yet, and neither is the balance. But even then, if the balance is sort of out of whack, but then there's like a million different cards for maximum novelty, I'm definitely okay with that. Like, I doubt anyone who enjoys roguelikes is gonna complain about occasionally whack balance given the nature of the genre. It's only when it's remarkably bad at the ground floor, or too frequently bad, is it an issue. So in essence, so long as that sense of discovery and novelty holds strong, I'm gonna be having extreme extremely positive vibes. Especially if there's really fun meme builds in this game, because finding stupid interactions and making them work is, quite frankly, one of life's greatest gamer joys. If all goes well with Grim Coven, I can easily see it becoming one of my favorites. So that's gameplay. Then for the more personal nonsense coming in from nowhere, I, I want more hunters that look like the dudes on the cover. Uh, I need a giant werewolf enemy in the game Pronto. I need an environment card that places a mini that's literally a wall with a window in it, and when you interact with it, you're, you can get one of multiple secret cards where you can talk to different NPCs, who will task you with random objectives. You're gonna forget about just like in Bloodborne. Look, man, just, just give me more Bloodborne. I'm dying over here. It's been like 10 years, still an old PC port or a Bloodborne 2, man. Please, bro. I'm, I'm about to turn into Corrupted Daniel from Too Much Little Men and, and flip my board, aka take my shirt off and howl at the moon. Thank you all for watching the video. If you'd like to support us, drop a like. And if you want to go further, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash the shelf side. And if you want to be able to post sick YouTube comments, consider becoming a member with the join button next to our channel. And now, instead of the usual outro, enjoy me and Mr. KDM randomly talking about Grim Coven. See ya. Hey, Mr. KDM guy, you have uh, any thoughts on this uh, boss battle? Man, this character I'm playing is not very interesting. Now, great theme and the way the mechanics work with the theme is interesting. Just, uh, if, if I have to just like, you know, purely rate what I've experienced up to this point, it's okay but I don't really see why I would ever play it over Kingdom Death Monster, except for the, the theme, which is cool. The fact that there are minions and there's an elite is great, but basically as soon as we eliminated them, the challenge was over. At least for me, it was like, this is I just- I felt uh, the same, man. I think, yeah, you're right. The the elite is the uh, the weak point. I mean, he's the, like the principal threat on the board, assuming you can consistently break the boss every single time. If you kill the elite, then there's not really a lot of threats because the minions are too slow and it's too trivial to just keep jumping from one side of the map to the other. There's no difficulty and it's gonna be like another hour of doing, can you properly do the puzzle or or like me, like I had uh, with those minions where it's just, it's just a stupid mistake. There's no reason to let those minions hit me. And if I didn't, there would have been no tension at all. Kind of too easy. But on that first run, that was like crushingly difficult. So it sort of worries me. Is this game kind of like the Frosthaven? Not all Frosthaven scenarios, but some Frosthaven scenario design philosophy where it's like you should have just known that there was going to be a turret, you know, this many hexes from the door in the next room uh, because now he's one too many away from you and you just die. Or, you know, you needed jump in the scenario because halfway through it, um, you're gonna have a, a guy that you have to escort and you need to grant him movement. But if he had jumped, then, you know, whatever. Did you feel the same thing that I did where I was like, huh, it seems too easy to just break the boss's body part and then he does a shitty reaction and just run away from yes. him. Like, I, I tried to do tanking and that is obviously an incorrect way to play this game. The enemies hit, it's, I mean, it's exactly as you said, the enemies hit stupid hard. So and to me, it's like anytime you're using an action to armor up, or re-roll your dice or cleanse negative effects. It's just a turn you're not making any forward progress because you just need to be killing things and you need to kill things to get XP. So that way you can like get comically overpowered, uh, which is cool. Is it really that comically overpowered? These guys are both pretty close to dying to me. Uh, yes, but any HP above zero is just as good. Maybe if I played that character, I would have had more fun, but uh, I, yes. I mean, perhaps there's other builds what would be cool is if you had this deck of cards, which was maybe like a hundred cards or something. I don't know, a lot of cards, we'll say. And in each scenario, you customize this and you bring in like 10 or something.
or 20, I don't know, whatever. Look at this heavy gamer here. Well, the way they did items in ISS Vanguard was exactly the same as what I'm describing, basically. You started the game with no one having really any items at all, maybe just like a med pack. But as you progressed, you picked up hundreds of these cards. I mean, there's so many of them to the point it's like absurd. Most of them never even get used. Uh, partially because they're bad, or you just don't have space to bring The Bethesda RPG mentality. Right. So uh, I don't think it's impossible to do what I'm describing. Really, yeah, I guess my long-winded ramble can be sufficed with, uh, this seems fine. <laughs> if, if the progression system isn't, like, really, really intense, then I have no interest. I think this would be a great campaign game. I mean, I played ISS Vanguard <laughs> almost 90% of the way with my dad, and he really liked that but that didn't have a lot of progression. It had some, but it was mostly just like getting more cards on top of what you already had, like items. How many more hundreds of items do I need? <laughs> so much of this game to me is like, I think the gameplay is like solid. I'm not blown away by it. I think it's like very good for what it is. And then it's just like, but then I need the bigger context. So I'm very annoyed at the prototype that didn't go and send like more like continuation shit. If it is the case where we get a bunch of items that do wacky, silly things, then I think this game could be great. But if there's not, if it's just this, I'm, it's kind of dour. No, it, it would be like if we're playing Frosthaven and there's a big map, maybe like a five room map and there's treasure chests. And when you collect those treasure chests, you would get like a level two card and a level three card and, and that's it. That's the game. <laughs> uh, I wonder if this, if we aren't just compensating, <laughs> like we have a lot of, it feels a lot like ISS Vanguard in that there's a ton of mechanics and, um, you know, they all, there's all these lots of little different things and little pieces, but it's the core gameplay mechanic of rolling these dice and seeing what you get, that was an amazingly lucky result. Um, <laughs> and seeing what you get and then assigning that to actions, is that fun? Not for this guy. Uh, not at, at first it is because you kind of have like choices to make, but the more- Once everything comes bullets, yeah. <laughs> it, yes, it is like, I don't give a shit what I roll. Just every result is basically the same thing. But that oh. just means I stack the deck in my favor. I understand saying, because also if the game just incentivizes you to do that anyways and pulling away from the interesting part, which is, Let's see what I can make with what I got, right? Then it's like, oh yeah, we just we've optimized the fun out of the game, right? Like, and also, if this was more inconsistent, it would be harder to do that. Bigger day, yeah. right? If this was a hundred cards, okay, <laughs> no, that's absurd. Yeah, I mean, just uh, make them like stronger, but maybe more inconsistent. Uh, it's not fun to like draw stuff and go like, wow, that's junk. It's like I just wasted my time. But uh, you can always get a die. Yeah, I mean, I like the you know the presentation. I think the minis. Or cool. Oh, I love the news. Yeah, it's uh, classic it's... away from Rum selling point. But also, more importantly, why does this guy have an alchemist? <laughs> why is he even here? This makes no sense. What is this theme? This is like a flavor fail. This this guy should obviously be like the steed or uh, like the lieutenant of the general. He should be like a swordsman.